Do you know what time it is? It's Supernatural Story Time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only, only in the dark. dark. Don't Go in the Woods, Volume 5, Story Number 1. My friend Janine and I worked in an old hall in Lowstoft, Suffolk in the early 90s. I was living about a mile from the hall. We finished work at about 11 p.m. and were going back to mine for a drink. There we were, me wheeling my cycle and her holding a plate with a slice of lemon meringue pie on it, walking down an unlit dual carriageway. Halfway down this road was a lay-by hidden from the road by a small island covered in trees and bushes. We heard a van pull into the lay-by, and a minute later we heard a noise behind us. Looking back, we saw a man pretending to pee while looking back the way we'd come. Strange. He turned and looked straight at us, jumped onto the road and started to chase us. We shot down the road. It was late with hardly a car bout. Janine pulled me across the road in an attempt to force a car to stop, but they just swerved around us, beeping their horn. The road was empty again. The man was gaining on us. My bag had caught on my bike, so I had to haul it on my shoulder. He reached out and grabbed my hair. I swung my bike and knocked him down. Running across the road, we saw an oldish man walking down the central reservation and ran towards him, shouting for help. He was dressed in weird clothes. A tweed suit and the trousers came to just below his knees like plus fours. We looked back. The guy had seen him too and had turned around and and was running back to his van. We were only about ten feet from him, but the old guy seemed not to see us and kept looking into the distance as though nothing was happening. This infuriated us and we ran towards him, demanding to know what he was playing at. When, just as we reached him, he disappeared. Absolutely gobsmacked, we ran on until we got to the farmhouse where I lived and called the police. The guy who had chased us fitted the description of someone who had attacked a girl in the next village to us. One of the policewomen told us that many years ago, a man and his family had crashed not far down the road, and they had tried to walk to the village for help, but died of his injuries before he got there. He'd been seen quite a few times before. He may not have saved his family all those years ago, but he sure saved us that night. The upside of this is that all through this Janine managed to keep hold of that pie. Nothing has ever tasted so good. Story number two. I was asleep one night when I awoke, realizing that I couldn't breathe. Now, I have several cats. Don't most psychic people? And on occasion, they will lie down on my face while sleeping. Such is their way. As a wise person once told me, the one thing to always remember about cats is... If they were bigger, they'd eat you. So I assumed this is what was happening. However, when I was fully awake, I realized that I couldn't move, and furthermore, that it was my pillow that was covering my face. I was lying on my side, and the pillow I had in my head was folded up over my face. So, once again, I assumed the cat had just slipped under there, but that wasn't it. I started to panic because I couldn't move, and I also couldn't breathe. Now, the pillow just wasn't covering my face, it was being pressed into my face. I finally was able to, using all my might, move my head just a little bit back and forth. After a couple of seconds of that, the pillow suddenly dropped from my face, and standing right next to my bed was this tall, thin death figure, except all in white, like a skeleton in a long, heavy, hooded robe that covered all but the hands. Where the face would be was just ethereal whiteness. Within a split second, this figure reached down and grabbed my bedspread and pulled it over my face and held it tight, trying to suffocate me again. I thought, this thing is going to kill me. I have to do something, but again, I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. Then I remembered that I had been studying up on oars and I realized this was my only chance. Again, with all my might, I envisioned an energy field around me and when it had solidified, I pushed it as hard as I could towards this thing by my bed. Suddenly the bedspread flew off my face and nearly off the bed, and I was able to see this thing being flung back to wherever it came from. It just quickly flew back away from the bed, getting smaller and smaller until it disappeared. 
When it was gone, I was suddenly able to move again, so I immediately jumped out of bed and flung on all the lights and started screaming and crying, still being frightened out of my mind. I couldn't stop screaming and crying about it for two days. I had truly felt like someone had just tried to kill me. I couldn't go to work. I couldn't do anything. It took about a week for me to be able to go back into my bedroom, and then about a month for me to be able to go to sleep without having all the lights on. People who know this event ask me how I could still live there. I tell them, if something evil is out to get you, it will find you wherever you are. Moving won't change that. This happened in April of 2003. Next story. Here are random little ghostly events that have occurred in my current apartment. The first ghost experience I ever encountered, there was a waking one night to find a full-size horse standing by my bed. Quite a sight in my tiny apartment. I screamed, what is that? and then noticed there was a cowboy on the horse, dressed in traditional Old West garb. He tipped his hat to me, lightly kicked the horse with his spurs, and the horse sauntered off through the wall. Now, I live in the second story, and the wall the horse went through was an outside wall. So people always ask me, well, didn't the horse fall once it was outside? Hello? It's a ghost. If it can go through the wall, do you think a little thing like gravity would be a concern? Another time... I woke to find a guy standing at the foot of my bed. He was dressed in a dark blue check shirt and khaki pants. He was about maybe 50 and was kind of pudgy. He didn't seem threatening at all. Once he realized I saw him, he just disappeared. Another time, I was trying to fall asleep and noticed a lump under my bed moving from the edge of the bed towards me, kind of slowly. I assumed one of my cats had crawled under there and was approaching me, so I put my hand out to pet it on top of the cupboard saying, Oh, what a cute kitty. However, as soon as I put my hand down for the pet, the lump disappeared. Nothing was there. That totally freaked me out because it had been a pretty big lump. Definitely cat-sized. In my bedroom, I have a huge window that takes up at least half of the wall. Living in the middle of the city, there's always significant ambient light coming through that window. Not to mention my neighbor's very bright security light he always has on. Anyway, one night, as I turned off the light to go to sleep, suddenly I was thrown into total darkness. Like, have you ever been deep in a cave where no light can go? That kind of darkness that is total, complete, and threatening. So I immediately turned the light back on and looked out the window to see if maybe the power had gone off in the city or something. But no, all my town's lights were still on, shining through my window. So I turned the light off again and total evil darkness again almost like being thrown into another dimension so the light came on immediately again and stayed on the rest of the night another time I awoke just in time to see this hairy creature running at me carrying a club over his head like he was going to hit me with it I screamed and the creature stopped and was suddenly flung backwards getting smaller and smaller until it disappeared now most of these things have occurred at night so skeptics could say oh you were tired so you imagined it etc However, several times during the day in my living room, I will have this little cloud of small lights appear and swirl around near the ceiling for several minutes at a time. Since I am usually engrossed in my TV show, my cats are usually the ones to notice them first. They will all run to just below the cloud and all stand up on their hind legs and reach out with their paws towards the lights, chattering the way cats do when they are excited. Then, just as suddenly as they arrive, they are gone, and the cats go back to their business of sleeping and destroying everything I own. Oh well. Next story. I'd been living in Santa Barbara back in 1993 when I found myself suddenly unemployed. After several months without luck finding a job, I started going to the local temp agencies for work. One by one they turned me down telling me that with my engineering degree they weren't going to be able to place me because I was overqualified for anything they had to offer. So out of the seven temp agencies in town, the first six had turned me away without even taking my resume. However, the seventh place not only took me and they actually gave me a job and I found out later that this last place was run by two ladies who both had strong psychic abilities and many of the workers also had psychic abilities. So anyway, at the job they got me, I became friends with this one girl who also worked with them who was a strong psychic. She would tell me what I had for breakfast that day or what I would find in my mail when I got home, stuff like that. It was kind of freaky. 
I was really into using a Ouija board at that time and have since learned why one should never do that. And that was this girl's main practice. So we would get together all the time and use her Ouija board, which she had specially made. It was round and made of wood and elaborately decorated. It was actually very nice as a piece of art. Well, this girl's background story was that and every incarnation she had been through, she had always ended up being killed by this evil spirit who was jealous of her relationship with her soulmate. Apparently also, she had always been killed with the same jeweled dagger. So in this incarnation, she said, she had identified her soulmate and the evil spirit who happened to be married to each other this time around, and she had a photograph of them with this woman having a jeweled dagger stuck on her belt as some kind of decoration perhaps. Anyway, so take this part of the story as you will. So, we were doing the board one night and we are talking with her guardian angel. Suddenly an evil spirit took over the board and started swearing at us and threatening us so we decided to send it away and call it a night. At this point it was about 2 in the morning. We were discussing what had just happened and I mentioned to my friend that I would try to help her in any way I could spiritually to save her from repeating fate. She thanked me and I gathered my things and left. I was about 10 steps outside her door when suddenly someone screamed in my ear. It was almost like someone ran past me screaming at me because the volume was very low and then very loud and then very low again. I spun around but of course no one was there. My friend lived in an apartment complex but being two in the morning all was quiet around. I was scared and went back to my friend's place. I thought I knew what I had heard but we brought out the board again and called for a guardian angel to confirm it. What I had heard was, don't help her you jerk. So now, I'm scared out of my wits thinking her evil spirit is now after me. It took a while to calm me down, and my friend said that she would ask her guardian angel to accompany me home, to make sure I was safe. I kind of poo-pooed that in my mind, thinking that was impossible, but agreed. So I get in my car and start driving home. Several minutes later, when I was in the freeway of all places, what should happen but? Suddenly a man, her guardian angel I assume, appeared sitting in the passenger seat of my car, solid as you or I. He was about 35, blonde hair, wearing a red plaid jet shirt and blue jeans. His body was turned towards mine and he smiled at me and waved and then disappeared. I thought to myself, what? He did follow me home. That's cool. Then, when I got back to my apartment and parked my car, this man appeared again, solid as before, sitting cross-legged on the hood of my car, again smiling and waving at me. Then the next morning, as I was taking a shower, suddenly two eyeballs appeared in the wall of my shower and looked around and disappeared. That freaked me out the most, but only because I was naked at the time in the shower. I assume the eyeballs belonged to this guardian angel. So, nothing bad happened to me in regards to the evil spirit, and I never saw the red plaid man again. Many people ask me, weren't you scared when he showed up in your car when you were going 70 miles per hour? And I say, no, actually. A sense of peace and calm came over me each time he appeared, and I knew that I was safe with him. It was a very interesting experience, to say the least. Next story. One of the most infamous spots around here in Buffalo Ridge, Ohio, a hilly road that's just a bit northwest of Cincinnati and Cleves. It's actually home to the Mitchell Memorial Forest, a park complete with a natural trail, lake for fishing, and a playground for the kiddies. Woohoo! Not only that, but supposedly this road is where Charles Manson himself spent his Cincinnati years. I say supposedly since I know his family lived around here at the time, but I never really looked into whether or not he grew up around Cleves. Not that it's important to the story anyway. Well, the urban legends of this road are outrageous. Stories range from being chased across the road at night by white vans, to phantom cars from failed gang initiations, an evil dog with glowing green eyes, ghosts that run across the road searching for their missing parts for all eternity, and most importantly, the crematorium. You see, the urban legends say this road was the site of a corrupt crematorium that dropped bodies out in the woods, blah, blah, blah. And now supposedly bodies are still out there somewhere. Well, in high school, I actually had an English teacher who told me that one time, he and his friend drove down there, pulled over, and just happened to open a random barn door for whatever reason, and found chickens hanging from the ceiling on chains and their blood being collected on leaves below. So they ran back to their car and, of course, Grave Digger or some other monstrous truck 
comes tearing out of a driveway and chases him all the way out of Cleves. That's all well and good, but as I soon found out from personal research, there was never a crematorium there. What is there to this day, however, is the ruins of Cincinnati's first planetarium, hidden in the woods. In fact, at the time I had made that site, I had tried just about everything and experienced nothing more than a police officer pulling over and literally laughing at us as we explained to him that we wanted to see dead people run across the road. I can feel my feel esteem rising. It also occurred to us that the park staff had rangers and white vans visiting it frequently, thus killing the chase by white van experience for us. And so, with all of that out of the way, I cannot explain my story. A few weeks ago, I had led a couple of my friends that are new to the area down to Buffalo Ridge. These friends being my old friend Jonathan, who's the same age as me and grew up in Indiana, and Kay, his as-of-now girlfriend. I think, well, we got there about 9 p.m. when the sun was close to setting all the way, and as usual, I had them park down the road a bit near another road, the name of which slips my mind, and walk back up to a no-dumping-or-will-own-your-butt sign, behind which is a trail leading down the woods into the ruins of the old planetarium. Being the loser who loves to tell the local history that I am, I was talking pretty loudly about the area while Kay and Jonathan walked behind me. They both carried a couple of flashlights to see better in the thick woods, and I just toughed it out in front. Oh yeah, I'm a real man. I try. Anyway, we come out to what I can only describe as the foundation of the building. A bunch of bricks and torn metal in the hillside is all I got. We sat down and started chatting it up about whatever, and a good 30 minutes passed. Jonathan and I were discussing manly things like whether we should go get those tiny fries at Steak and Shake, or an even manlier jug of root beer at the Jollies up in Fairfield. Around then, Kay started mumbling about how the air changed or something to that degree. So in hopes to see something spooky, I climbed down into the foundation of the old planetarium and took Jonathan's flashlight so I could navigate walking around the fallen stones and whatnot. At one point, I remember Kay saying, we should get going, and by then, I had already made my way to the other side of the rubble and was wanting to look around some more. But Jonathan didn't like making her nervous, so I agreed to climb back out. So being the nice guy I am, I started to make my way back across the rubble. At this point, I shined my light back up the wall I had climbed down to see Kay and Jonathan when I saw it. A man I couldn't really make out from where I was was approaching the two of them. So jokingly, I shouted, Hey, better tell that guy that we aren't sacrificing babies or drug dealers or drug dealers sacrificing babies. Went back to my climbing across the rubble. Eventually, I made it up the wall and no one was freaking there. Annoyed, I walked back up the trail to Buffalo Ridge and found Kay crying while Jonathan hugged her. Aw. So I asked what happened to our guest. When Jonathan starts ranting on and on about how this dude just totally came out of nowhere, walked right up to me, and vanished, which made our heads spin. From then on, we were pretty static, running back to the truck with Kay frightened, while Jonathan was excited and I was pissed. I wanted a ghost to walk up to me and disappear, and I didn't even see it since I was walking over some flipping stones and whatnot. Never again will I look where I'm going. Okay, bad idea. So finally, the story has become one of the only real ghosts we've got to talk about. But it's a fun story nonetheless, and has actually gone down at the Art Institute I go to as the unknown man. Next story. I was in the Navy and living ashore at Norfolk, Virginia in the early 70s. It was an old two-story house. The main floor had a kitchen, dining room, and living room. The second floor had a master bedroom that nearly half the size of the house and a smaller bedroom and a bath. One day I was in the master bedroom folding laundry. People came and went all the time, had a couple of roommates, and they had friends, so the doors were seldom, if ever, locked. I heard the front door open and close and called out. I was upstairs. I heard heavy, plodding footsteps on the stairs, pausing at the bend in the middle. It was as if whomever was really tired and was all they could do to walk up the steps. From where I was standing, I could see clearly down the hall to the top of the stairs. The footsteps continued to the top and down the hall towards me no one was there. The steps were quite audible. At the threshold of the bedroom door, they stopped. I stood there shaking like a leaf, then quickly 
exited the room. Sometime later, I returned home to find every light in the place on. A roommate was sitting in the living room, white as a sheet, holding a poker from the fireplace in front of him. I asked what was wrong. He said he was watching TV when the door to the outside, the former front door since the house at one time faced Chesapeake Bay, but at some time was moved across the street and turned around, so our front door had been the back door at one time and our back door the front, began turning on its own. He asked who was there and no answer. Then the door started shaking as if someone were trying to enter but couldn't. He went to the door and called out again. No reply. He opened the door and no one was there and the screen door was closed and lashed with no breaks in the screen for someone to reach in. I told him of my experience earlier and he said he had heard footsteps as well when no one was home. He never told anyone believing they would think him crazy. Eventually others reported hearing strange things as well. The old house is no longer there. It was on a spit of land which has been redeveloped with freeways, ramps, etc. Now Another story is about my apartment building in Huntington, West Virginia. Has several spirits. Residents in two apartments on the other end of the hall, I live in the back, had reported seeing an old woman in a white blouse and long black dress into their apartment, walk through and exit. At one time, this building had a landlady from who owned the place from about 1911 to 1951. This could be her keeping an eye on the property. I'm the senior resident in the building three-story brick apartment erected in 1906 have moved here in July of 1979 and people will ask you've been here a long time have you heard of this or that happening one evening in the early 80s a neighbor and I were playing cards no radio TV or anything like that was on suddenly we heard loud noises coming from his apartment as if we were being ransacked Scott went to check and nothing was out of place I have also had the feeling someone would be watching me from that apartment when no one was living there. My kitchen window and that one forms a sort of L shape. I named the spirit Casper, after the cartoon character Casper, the friendly ghost since he means no harm, merely curious. And when I have that feeling of being watched, I always wave and greet him. There is also a ghost in my apartment. It was August 2nd, a hot muggy night. The cat I had then was laying on the floor facing the closet bathroom door. This was before the net, so I was watching TV and Muffy was in my line of vision. Suddenly she roused herself, started a low growl, twitching her tail, looking at the closed door, then to me, back to the door. I told her there was nothing there. Like a scene from a cheap movie, I went to the door, put my hand on the doorknob and said, see, there's nothing in there, and opened the door. Suddenly a cold rush of air passed through me, at least 20 degrees cooler than a moment before. After that, Muffy was calm again and went back to her dozing. For a couple of years on that date, I could feel the presence. I haven't done that for the last few years. Next story. In 1978, my parents bought a 30-year-old house which was originally owned by an actress whose full name I will not reveal. Anne was her first name. She was famous in the 30s through 50s era. Anyway, I was born in 1979, and from an early age, I remember a few instances where I was spooked. My first odd experience occurred one normal night when I was about four or five years old. For some reason, I awoke and got out of bed. I heard something in the kitchen, which was directly down the hallway from my doorway. It was very late or early in the morning. When I peered down the hallway, I saw a rabbit on our kitchen counter. Its eyes were bright, and its body was almost see-through, like a projection. I was scared and tired, so I ran across the hallway to my older sister's room and slept there the rest of the night. Sure enough, nobody believed me the next day. Over the next few years, I always heard noises in my closet and cupboards in my bedroom. And all the while living there, I always heard shuffling and pounding in a large walk-in safe in the downstairs part of our house. In the ten years span living there, I always felt like I was being watched, and I would never go inside the house unless my parents or someone else was with me. When I got off the school bus, I would wait outside until my mom got home. It was not until my mother told me a few things that she probably would not have revealed had she known how I would react. I overheard my mother talking to my aunt about how the previous owner told her that an actor by the name of Anne Blank had built the house. Even more interesting, the previous owners laughingly said they would occasionally see her walking down the hall. 
Once my mother even admitted to me that she was home alone reading in the living room when she felt someone touch her on the shoulder. It was a comforting gesture but scared her when she turned and saw no one around. I was scared of that house. When I was about 12, we moved to a house my dad built, some city but miles away from the old house. The first night staying there, I remember waking and looking out my bedroom window to see a white figure running down the lonesome road as a swift and graceful pace. Also, my beloved dog was in my sight and he ran from the object with tail between its legs. Not typical, this dog was a butt kicking machine. It was weird, but I was able to fall back asleep. Next day, nobody took me seriously. The last incident happened shortly after. I remember just laying down in my bed. It was a matter of seconds before I saw this woman hovering over me and she did not speak, but it was like she said, I have followed you. I lay there paralyzed, but managed to say, get out, leave me alone. And ever since I have been totally ghost free, knock on wood. Long, maybe boring story for you guys, but real to me, too real. Next story. Some will argue there is no such thing as ghosts. I understand those individuals may feel frightened by the thought of phantoms or banshees roaming our world, or some individuals may just assume that ghosts are a bunch of silly fictional myths that our kind make up from using fairy tales to be told over the past centuries. However, seeing is believing. And if I never saw the things I've seen in my lifetime, perhaps I too would question their existence. My first real poltergeist experience happened when I was about five years old. It was late at night and I was awoken by a sound coming from the dining room. I heard the dinner table chairs roughly sliding against the tile floor. When I finally realized I was awake and not dreaming, I became horrified. A few seconds went by and the chairs suddenly stopped moving. Then the ever most terrifying thing happened. I heard an unearthly woman's voice call to me. The voice sounded like it came from the kitchen adjacent to the dining room. I can't recall everything she said, but I'm pretty sure she was just saying my name over and over. The hardest thing I had to do was get out of bed and run like heck to my mother's bedroom across the pitch black hall. Eventually, after the paralysis wore off, that is exactly what I did. I remember tripping on the laundry basket and sneaking over to my mom's side of the bed. I didn't want to wake her and be sent back to my room. She woke up immediately when I crawled into her arms. She told me it was just a nightmare and go back to my room. She had to turn on my bedroom light and walk me to bed. Naturally, I couldn't fall asleep for quite some time that night, even with my twin sister asleep in the room. I remember having to stare at our Dr. Seuss light fixture for comfort. Every time I glanced at that bedroom door, I would quiver intensely. I did not dare go investigate the kitchen or dining room until the next morning. Of course, everyone laughed at me the next day when I explained exactly what happened. My older brother and dad even had an ongoing joke about the ghost chair, which was the only unassigned chair when the five of us were eating at the dinner table. They would kid and demand my mother to fix up a plate of food for the ghost. I kept thinking to myself, one day they'll see. That day wasn't too far off, at least for my brother and sister. A few years later, on a stormy early evening, the three of us were left home alone. At that time, our brother was old enough to babysit us, but too immature to properly accompany us. He used to tease us all the time about ghosts. Ghostbusters had just come out in the theater, so of course that was still fresh in everyone's mind. One time he even made what he convinced us to believe a PK meter that would indicate if ghosts were nearby. The little stick on the homemade PK meter would move sporadic like, so he would tell us that this house was haunted and filled with ghosts. But during this occasion he decided to just tell us scary stories instead. With a lightning, loud thunder, our parents gone, and my brother's wickedness, we became two very scared little girls. My brother eventually came to his senses and then tried to comfort us. He kept trying to reassure us that ghosts were make-believe. Then he said these words, which I will never forget. There is no such thing as ghosts. If there was, they would show us a sign. Boom. Instantly, after those words came out of my brother's mouth, all the lights went out. They eventually came back on a couple of seconds later. My brother never teased us about ghosts again. That incident may not sound tremendously frightening, but as a child it seemed as if I were living in a horror picture. My next occurrence may very well be the most petrifying. I was about 18 or 19 years old. My sister and I went for a drive to Siesta Key in Sarasota. 
The sun was just about setting. We decided before we went home for the day, we should drive around the Keys Ritzy subdivision to gawk at all the pretty mansions. We came across an empty lot, which is unusual because it was fairly decent in size and located right in the canal. All the other lots in the area consist of massive homes neck and neck to each other. It was so peculiar to see such a large waste of space, which had so much value. My sister wanted me to pull over to the curb so we could walk around to go exploring. She said, let's pretend we own this lot and we're going to build a big mansion here. As we were walking through the palmettos further within the lot, a sudden freezing cold chill overcame us and the sky instantly turned gray. My anxious sister said, we need to leave now. She believed she was being intuitive and was being shown a sign. She imagined something bad would happen to us if we stayed there. She even said, I think someone is living here like a bum or some crazy person. No, it's okay, we're fine. I hesitantly replied, although I started to sense some uncertainty about staying in that lot. She said, well, I'm going back to the car. I then quickly followed her, thinking to myself, I'm brave, but not brave enough to be here alone. We drove off into the subdivision to complete our little adventure in searching for a favorite mansion to drool over. It was now officially nighttime, so we agreed to head out. As trying to find the exit of the key, we unintentionally came across our vacant lot. I stopped the car positioned head on so we could glance at it one more time. Because it was dark, we could see the lights from another home on the opposite side of the canal glaring through the trees. My sister said, oh look, you can see through those people's windows over there. We both were staring at the same spot and that's when it happened. A silhouette of a man or creature appeared before us, maybe about 20 or 30 feet from the car. It looked like it was staring at us with evil intentions. The odd thing was that it, this shadow had no face. He was completely transparent. Do you see what I see? My sister muttered and I said, yep. I don't think I ever peeled out of somewhere so fast than I did that day. We were frightened, but it made for good laugh on our way back home. Up until then, I never really felt threatened by a ghost. Before they would just make themselves known. This one was different. He made it extremely obvious he did not want our presence in his territory. I would imagine he must have made attempts to hoard off any other unwanted guests. After all, it was the only empty lot in the whole neighborhood. My only other evidential ghost encounter up to date occurred about two years ago. One late night I was sitting in my driveway trying to contact my spirit guide who I call Sunbeam. Spirit guides are thought to be predestined spirits who help us subconsciously through our lifetimes, similar to the belief of guardian angels protecting us. When I communicate with Sunbeam, I don't physically see her or hear her voice, I just talk to her as if I'm saying my prayers out loud. While sitting there rambling, I abruptly noticed to my left a luminous apparition of a fair-skinned woman with long blonde hair floating down the street about three feet above the ground. She was wearing a soft blue and white renaissance-like gown and some sort of hat or veil. The instant we made eye contact, she vanished before my eyes. I assume I saw my spirit guide, but I didn't have that comforting feeling I often felt when I'd communicate with her. Plus, that wasn't how I envisioned her. If anything, I thought she would look just like a ball of energy, if she chose to appear at all. At times, I believe that spirit guides do not prefer to appear to us because they have no desire to prove themselves to us. I then realized I had just seen a ghost.